Hello, and welcome to another episode in this series on uh, learning and behavior. And in this particular uh, lesson, I'm going to talk to you about the comparator hypothesis. Now, the comparator hypothesis is not one of the most famous. <laughs> uh, it's not, uh, not taught in introductory psychology books. But it's really important, <laughs> and its uh, implications are, are pretty wide and profound for uh, studies of uh, Pavlovian conditioning. And uh, on this, uh, we owe to the work of uh, Ralph Miller and uh, his uh, research associates who developed this comparator theory over a period of uh, 15 years or so. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Ralph Miller is also not one of the people that uh, you think of <laughs> right away when you think about Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, um, but for those of us in the business, <laughs> he's a giant in the field rivaling the likes of Raskorler and uh, Alan Wagner. And, uh, and I would say, uh, I think uh, his empirical contributions uh, uh, probably are as a as extensive and profound uh, as those of Pavlov. Of course, he didn't start Pavlovian conditioning. And he built one of the largest uh, laboratories for the study of Pavlovian conditioning. His lab probably was bigger than that of B.F. Skinner, certainly bigger than uh, the lab laboratories of Bob Raskorla or Alan Wagner. He had uh, more than 80 experimental chambers. At the height of my uh, uh, empirical work, uh, we had about uh, three dozen experimental chambers. Yeah, he had more than twice as many. Anyway, pretty remarkable guy. Let's uh, move on to the first slide, which shows you some of the basic elements of the comparator hypothesis and a picture of, uh, of Ralph Miller. So uh, this particular theory is an effort to integrate memory retrieval mechanisms into a theory of learned performance. So he was concerned about what determines whether or not you perform a conditioned response. And so it's a theory of performance, not a theory of learning per se. And uh, it assumes that you only learn excitatory associations. And that uh, feature of the theory has been a bit controversial. And it raises the question, of course, you know, how do you get inhibitory responding? How do you get condition inhibition? And I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, but let's uh, look at the next slide, which uh, uh, outlines the key elements of the theory, uh, namely that uh, you've got a target stimulus, a condition stimulus that is the, your focus of, uh, of, of your uh, uh, investigation, but you can't present that in a vacuum. It has to present, be presented in a particular place, particular context. And, uh, and so there are other cues that are present whenever a target CS is presented. And uh, the comparative hypothesis uh, tells you that uh, uh, you have to pay attention to the conditioned excitatory value of not just the target stimulus, but also of the contextual cues in the presence of which the target was uh, trained in order to predict what the nature of the conditioned response is going to be. And how the, uh, that those predictions are made is illustrated in the next slide. Uh, this, this is a uh, relatively complicated uh, theory, and so I want to start by showing you what it, how it works in a picture uh, which I created. Um, so it's the term is comparator hypothesis. So you're comparing two things, and so hence the scale with the balance with uh, uh, something on each side. What are you comparing? Well, you're comparing the excitatory value of the target CS, which is illustrated on the right side of the balance, and you're comparing that to the excitatory value or how much conditioning has occurred to the contextual cues or other stimuli that were present when the target was trained. So it's the excitatory value of the comparator stimulus. And you're comparing those two, and then uh, whether you get excitatory or inhibitory responding depends on 
which side of the balance is stronger, which type of excitation is stronger. If uh, excited, excitation to the target is stronger, then the balance kind of gets pushed down on the right side. I should quit using my hands because <laughs> the camera reverses <laughs> my image. Uh, so if, uh, if, if the target has excessive, extensive excitatory value, you get uh, the right side of the uh, balance is pushed down. If the context has a lot of uh, excitatory value or the comparative stimulus, then the left side of the balance gets pushed down. And if the right side of the balance is heavier, you get excitatory responding. If the left side of the balance is heavier, you get inhibitory responding. And so that's, in a sense, the, well, in, in, in a nutshell, what the comparative hypothesis is all about. And uh, uh, this diagram and this discussion so far doesn't tell you, you know, what, why it's so powerful and why it's so interesting. So let's go through a couple of examples. The first is, next slide shows you uh, a common procedure for fear conditioning. Uh, in uh, fear conditioning, you have a target CS, let's say a tone that's paired with shock, and uh, you're interested in how much fear is learned to the to the tone. But the tone has to pre be presented in a in the presence of background cues. Those background cues constitute the comparator, and if the animal gets shocked uh, in a particular place, the co contextual cues of that place also gain uh excitatory properties uh and uh what but what you're interested in is fear of the tone well in a lot of uh, fear conditioning experiments uh after doing the conditioning trials with the tone uh investigators uh do extinction trials for the context why do you want to do extinction trials for the context well, you do extinction trials for the context to lessen the weight of the excitation, excitatory properties of the comparator contextual cues or the left side of this balance. If you reduce the uh, weight on the left side of the balance, the, the balance favors the right side. And if it favors the right side, which is excitatory value of the target, you're going to get more excitatory responding. So if you're mostly interested in producing or seeing fear response that has been conditioned to the tone, you want to weaken the properties of the comparator. And uh, that's built into a common way in which uh, investigators study fear. So one of the interesting things about this comparator hypothesis is yet that you can alter the strength of a conditioned response not by doing anything to the target stimulus that elicits that response, but by modifying the comparator stimulus. So you haven't done anything to the tone here. All you've done is something to the contextual cues. You've extinguished the contextual cues. And that's a really powerful concept that you can you can uh, modulate responding to a target stimulus without doing anything with the target, rather by manipulating the comparator stimulus. So let's look at the next example, uh, which uh, uh, illustrates how the comparator hypothesis handles the problem of condition inhibition. So in an inhibitory conditioning procedure, you have two kinds of, during inhibitory training, you know, we have two kinds of trials. One, and here it, uh, it's illustrated as tone paired with shock is one kind of trial. And of course, the tone is going to become a, a strongly conditioned excitatory stimulus. And then you have other trials in which a tone and the light are presented together and no shock is presented. So the light is being trained here in the context of the tone. Okay, so the, if you're interested in condition inhibition, you're interested in inhibitory responding, developing to the light. Light, we, the way we talked about this in context of a scarlet Wagner model, that the light becomes a signal for the absence of shock. Well, what, uh, why does the light inhibit uh, fear? The comparative hypothesis tells us what the mechanism 
is and what the mechanism is, is if you look at, so target is the light. Uh, what's the excitatory value of the light? Uh, it, it, what do we put on the right side of this balance? Well, that's, there's going to be very little there because the light is never paired with shock. So it's going to have a very low excitatory value. What is on the left side of the balance, we're interested in the excitatory value of the comparative stimulus, the stimulus in the presence of which the light gets trained. What is that? Well, that's the tone. What is the excitatory property of the tone? Well, that's substantial because the tone gets paired with shock on other trials. So the left side of this balance is really heavy, which shifts the com that comparison shifts behavior towards inhibitory responding. If the left side wins, you get inhibitory responding. So how could we uh, reduce inhibitory responding? We talked in the context of the Scarlett Wagner model that uh, presenting an inhibitor by itself doesn't extinguish uh, the uh, inhibitory properties of the light. How can we reduce the extent to which the light is going to be an inhibitor? Well, what we have to do is to lighten the load on the left side of this balance, uh, decrease the excitatory value of the comparator, which means we have to extinguish the tone. So according to the comparator hypothesis, extinguishing the tone is going to reduce the extent to which the light elicits an inhibitory behavior. And that's a really powerful prediction, again, changing the behavior to a target stimulus without actually using or manipulating the target, you're manipulating a comparator stimulus. And uh, this particular method of reducing condition inhibition has been verified. <laughs> comparator hypothesis is right on this, on this score, and uh, it's a prediction that a Riscola Wagner model can't handle. Okay, let's look at another example, which uh, kind of <laughs> blows my mind even more. I mean, it, this is really a pretty uh, uh, dramatic. It has to do with the blocking effect. Uh, uh, just to review the blocking effect, uh, a blocking effect involves uh, first training stimulus uh, 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 stimulus A in this particular diagram. So in phase one, you do a lots of excitatory conditioning of stimulus A, and then you present A and B together, continuing to reinforce those trials or presenting the US, and you test stimulus B. And what you find is the stimulus B doesn't acquire excitatory, or con can't elicit a conditioned response. And we talk about condition responding to stimulus B being blocked by the prior conditioning of stimulus A. And this blocking effect was always considered to be a, a blocking of acquisition, a blocking of, blocking of learning. And uh, the comparative hypothesis and Ralph Miller and his associates tell us, no, it's not a problem of learning. The subject learns perfectly well to uh, uh, associate stimulus B with, uh, with the US, but uh, because stimulus A is the comparator that prevents the observation of excitatory conditioning. So how do we remove this interference with the performance of a conditioned response? Well, the interference comes from the strength of the comparator, the strength of the comparator. The comparator here uh, is stimulus A. If our target is stimulus B, then B is being trained in the presence of A, making A the contextual or comparator stimulus. And A, of course, has tremendous excitatory property, weight, if you will, because of its initial training in phase one. So the left side of the balance is very heavy <laughs> in a blocking design. And that, uh, and that pulls responding away from uh, excitatory responding and in a direction towards inhibitory responding. And that's why you don't see an excitatory response to stimulus B. 
how can we reduce the weight on the left side of the equation? Well, the same strategy that we've used in the previous examples, and that is in this case, the comparator of stimulus A, let's extinguish stimulus A. What should that do? Well, extinction of stimulus A should reduce the weight on the left side reduce the interference with excitatory responding, allowing the balance to shift a little bit towards the right, and which then allows you to see excitatory condition behavior. Pretty crazy, isn't it? And you wouldn't think this actually happens, but it does. <laughs> it actually does. This is a spectacular prediction of the comparative hypothesis one that uh, Ralph Miller and his colleagues have shown to be uh, be valid. So I'm pretty excited about the comparative uh, uh, hypothesis. And we may look at the next slide. Uh, this shows some of the mechanics. It's a pretty complicated uh, uh, theory. And this is a simplified version, actually, if you will. Uh, but it talks about how a target stimulus is going to activate a representation of the U.S. directly. We present the target, but the target will also activate the memory of the comparator stimulus, which in turn will activate uh, the representation of the U.S. indirectly through memory mechanisms. And the direct and the indirect uh, activations of the memory of the U.S. are going to be compared. And uh, if uh, the direct activation is stronger, you're going to see excitatory responding. If uh, uh, the uh, indirect memorial activation of the memory of the U.S. is stronger, then you're going to get inhibitory responding. Anyway, it's pretty wild. Uh, it's spectacular. It's Ralph Miller. And uh, I'm tremendously impressed. I hope uh, you will be also. Thanks very much for your attention.